to Rogue Bankers. When rumors of an impending revolution on the Isthmus of Panama reached the directors of the International Banking Corporation (parentheses IBC) in the fall of 1903, they immediately saw a financial opportunity and quickly mobilized to see it. They gathered in the boardroom of their leased offices at One Wall Street, cramped, unpresuming quarters at the top of a rickety wooden staircase above a drugstore. And there, as James Morris Morgan tells it, they resolved to spy out the land and report as to the advisability of establishing branches on the Isthmus. Morgan was the assistant manager of the IBC's Washington, D.C. borough. The high officials of the bank decided to send him to Panama to investigate. Though he claimed they chose him less for an inherent skills he had as a banker, than because the universal fear of the dreaded yellow fever saw all the other IBC employees sidestep the detail. Morgan reluctantly accepted the assignment, expecting to return to his desk at the IBC's G Street offices within a few months, unless he stated, the yellow fever gathers me in and I stay permanently. On December 1st, 1903, a month after Panama succeeded from Colombia following a brief U.S. supporter revolution, Morgan boarded the Panama Railroad, owned steamship Seguranca, and embarked for the newborn republic. His investigations on behalf of the IBC began the moment the Seguranca set sail. Members of the Panamanian Junta were among Morgan's Ew. shipmates. They were suspicious of his presence on the steamer and followed his every move during the voyage. Philip Jean Bunavarilla, the French engineer who was the Panamanian minister to the United States, keenly watched Morgan whenever Morgan appeared on deck. After three days at sea, Pablo Orozmena, future vice president of the Republic, approached Morgan. Rosamena discreetly inquired after Morgan's reasons for traveling to Panama. Morgan blurted out the nature of his mission and admitted to the IBC's interest in opening a bank in Panama. Taken aback by Morgan's Ew. frankness and candor, Arosa Mena gasped and quickly exited the room. Federico Boyd, another member of the junta, appeared at Morgan's Ew. door, entered his quarters, and testily told him that under no circumstances would Morgan Ew. be permitted to open a bank on the Isthmus. In a flash of anger, Boyd left Morgan's Ew. quarters. When Arosa Mena returned to suss out how Morgan Ew. fared in his interview with Boyd, an irritated Morgan Ew. drew on the powers of the IBC and of the U.S. government to let Boyd know that the bank would get its branch no matter the desires of the Panamanians. I told him, Morgan recalled, that General Thomas Ew. H. Hubbard, president of the International Banking Corporation, was not only a man of great wealth and social prominence, but he was a man of great influence in the councils of the Republican Party, and that as soon as the ship reached the dock in Colon, I was going to cable him that no American would be allowed to do a banking business in the country, and that of course he would make the contents of my cablegram public, and that I did not believe any United States senator would have the courage to vote for the recognition of a country which would not allow a reputable American banker to do business within its limits. Chagrined, Rosmena left the boardroom. Soon thereafter, Panamanian President Manuel Amador Guerrero made his entrance. In a conciliatory tone, he suggested that Morgan misunderstood Boyd's comments. What Boyd had actually meant was that no foreign bank would be permitted to flood the country with its notes. As the IBC was not a bank of issue, its presence would be welcome so long as Morgan was aware that its business would be unprofitable and that its directors were prepared to suffer heavy losses. Disembarking at Colon, Morgan Ew. traveled by train to Panama City, passing along the way settlements of quotations Chinamen and Jamaica Negroes, and the open graves of abandoned and broken machinery lining the banks of the Chagres River. Still celebrating Panama's independence, Panama City was papered with flags and bunting. And the entire Panamanian army, a ragtag bunch, quotations, mostly Negroes, attired in threadbare and ill-fitting uniforms and armed with vintage muskets, greeted the arrival of the president and the junta. 
Upon arrival, although discomfited by the heat and humidity, Morgan oh. immediately began inquiring into the banking possibilities of the IBC. His inquiries continued to be stifled. Panama's U.S. merchant community practically begged him to establish a branch of the IBC, but the local business elite disappointed that Morgan Ooh. did not personally know corporation lawyer William Nelson Cromwell, vexed that the former's namesake had sacked, looted, and burned the city to the ground in 1671, tried to dissuade him from his plans. Morgan Ooh. met with Jose Gabriel Duque, a naturalized U.S. citizen born in Cuba, who owned the Panama Star and Herald and controlled the lucrative national lottery. Duque, or Duque, as Morgan Ooh. referred to him, told him that the IBC would be ruined if it set up shop in Panama. Morgan Ooh. called on Isaac Ooh. Brandon, head of Isaac Brandon and Bros, merchant bankers and business on the Isthmus since 1878. Brandon Ooh. asserted that the establishment of a branch of the IBC on the Isthmus was signaled the institution's death knell. Henry Ooh. Ehrman agreed. One time peddler in Louisiana who had established himself on the Isthmus in 1865, Ehrman had emerged as what Morgan Ooh. described as the local king of finance. His bank doubled as a dry goods store and coils of rope, bolts of silk, and other merchandise tumbled from boxes and crates stockpiled in his office. During their conversation, two men pushed a cart piled high with silver pesos to the front of Ehrman's premises. Morgan watched as they dumped the silver on the sidewalk, and clerks came out and began counting the species. When Morgan Ooh. asked Ehrman the going rate of interest, Ehrman paused for a moment before replying, Whatever I choose to make it. When Morgan Ooh. asked him how much interest he paid depositors, Ehrman grinned and laughed and told Morgan Ooh. that he charged them 2% for taking care of their money. Morgan had seen enough. I decided then and there he wrote that Panama was a good place for a bank. Based on Morgan's Ooh. positive report to the directors, the IBC opened a branch in Panama City in 1904 and followed with agencies in Colon in 1906 and two years later at Empire, a town in the Canal Zone where the headquarters of the Isthmian Canal Commission was located. The Panamanian branches and agencies Morgan Ooh. was happy to say proved great success. But the IBC's operations were not limited to Panama. Its Panama branches were but a part of an expansive and ambitious project of imperial banking conceived by lawyer and industrialist Thomas H. Hubbard, Morgan's man of great wealth, social prominence, and influence. Hubbard had envisioned a world encircling banking corporation, a financial institution that would herald the arrival of the United States on the stage of global banking, finance, and commerce, while supporting the country's colonial ventures in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Quotations Heretofore, there has been no particular need in the U.S. for a banking institution doing an international business. Hubbard told the New York Times soon after the IBC was organized in 1901. But since the Spanish War and the tremendous trade of recent years with South America and the promise of a constantly increasing commerce with China and the Orient, the necessity for just such an institution as this has developed. Heretofore, all of the exchange with foreign countries has been handled by the banks of Berlin and London. There are a number of international banks in these cities. It will be the purposes of the IBC to secure as much possible of the exchange business heretofore handled by these foreign banks with which this country is concerned. Hubbard linked the IBC's organization to the triumphalist energies of American mission and destiny, claiming its organization was but the natural outgrowth of the commercial and territorial expansion of the United States. The Washington Post concurred. It stated that the birth of the IBC was the first step toward the transfer from London to New York of the financial supremacy of the world. The IBC's corporate seal evoked these ambitions. It depicted an American eagle astride a great temple that fused the two hemispheres of the globe. From the moment the IBC was chartered in 1901, it followed the example set by Samuel Ooh. Harvest and the North American Trust Company in Cuba and rushed to take advantage of the governmental and commercial opportunities opened up by U.S. military and diplomatic interventions. The IBC emerged both from the visions of empire and global commerce, floated by the Pan-American Financial Conferences at the end of the century, with their calls for an American international or a Pan-American bank, and from the nationalist bluster and chest-thumping that followed the U.S. victory over Spain. 
A handful of institutions, including the Pan American Bank, the Pan American Bank and Trust Company, and the Mexican Trust Company, sought to capitalize on this robustly imperialist mood. However, these institutions were little more than fly-by-night operations. Wildcat banks and bucket shops with global pretensions run by con men, swindlers, hustlers, and fraudsters that often survived only long enough to dupe their investors and depositors. The IBC was different, attempting to find an institutional form that could overcome the transnational jurisdictional morass of early 20th century global commerce and at the same time serve as an intermediary for the U.S. colonial bureaucracy. The IBC grew to become the staid, patrician, aberration among these early international banks. Later dubbed the United States' first international bank, it became a venerable elder statesperson in the field. Yet the history of the IBC was fraught. Imperialism did not come easy, and the IBC was not entirely successful in its operation. Instead, the IBC's much vaunted internationality, to borrow a phase that appeared in the bank's promotional material, was experimental and disorganized. The IBC's innovative charter and its worldwide branch network were coveted by other banking institutions, especially by national banking associations such as Citibank that were restricted from organizing branches. But it was seen as operating far below its potential. The IBC remained an institution in progress through its entire history. It was a pioneer in the foreign field, and as a pioneer, it often advanced blindly and haphazardly, inventing itself as it went, learning the terrain as it proceeded. The bank found itself fighting for business with both the Imperial Banks of Europe and its own brethren on Wall Street, and it was confronted with a problem of staffing and management and the fact that at the beginning of the 20th century, the U.S. international banker was anonymously a profession that was still being devised. The international vision of the IBC was Hubbard's. Ew. The work of realizing that vision was carried out by rogue bankers like James Morris Morgan, Ew. white men of varied and checkered international experience, who, with little to no banking background, became the foot soldiers of the IBC's imperial expansion and provided the IBC's working ties between racial capitalism and finance capitalism in Panama and around the world. Morgan and his ilk were tasked with making the IBC work in the face of disorganization, cultural difference, competition, and incompetence. His arrogance, his roguish methods, his assumption of American superiority, and his easy, naturalized sense of white supremacy made him a perfect candidate for the job. The institutional predecessors of the IBC are found in the 19th century debates concerning the commercial and monetary unification of the Americas especially through the Pan-American conferences and the often ill-fated attempts to organize banks as a result. The first of these conferences was held in Panama City in 1826 and convened by Simone Bolivier as a check on U.S. hegemony in the hemisphere. Subsequent conferences attempted to promote trade relations, encourage the standardization of commercial protocols, and assert U.S. economic supremacy. During the first International American Conference convened in Philadelphia on October 2, 1889, and continued in Washington from November 19, 1889 to April 19, 1890, the earliest calls for the development of an international U.S. banking institution were raised. Delegates pointed to the growing trade figures of the Americas as both a sign of the great strength of the bonds between the American republics and symptomatic of its primary weakness, its domination by European financiers. In the fiscal year ending on June 30, 1889, the total foreign commerce of the Caribbean, Mexico, and South and Central America amounted to some $1.2 billion in United States gold. During the same period, almost 300 million in goods was exchanged between the United States and South and Central America. European banks financed the bulk of this trade. A U.S. merchant importing or exporting goods to or from Latin America had to present a letter of credit secured from a European bank established in the region to a Latin American merchant for an advance on agricultural products or manufactured goods, remitting funds to Europe to cover the cost of the transaction. 
In the process, merchants were charged three quarters of 1% of the total cost of the shipped goods, as well as the fees for exchanging U.S. gold for Mexican silver or Spanish gold for sterling and back again for U.S. gold. European banks noted the delegates reaped this great profit at a minimum risk. Besides using the ship goods as collateral, American merchants often had to deposit cash with European bankers before their drafts reached maturity, causing a great problem of capital liquidity. This problem of liquidity hindered the growth of commerce by retarding the expansion of credit. The report from the conference's committee on banking argued that the future development of the hemisphere was contingent upon breaking a regional dependence on European banking institutions, especially the powerful British imperial banks, including the London and River Plate Bank and the London Bank of Mexico and South America. To staunch the loss of commissions to European bankers and to help promote not only the efficiency of financial transactions within the hemisphere, but also the region's very economic independence, delegates to the conference passed a resolution calling for the chartering of a Pan-American or American International Bank. The bank would be authorized by the U.S. Congress to instill public confidence in its stability and liquidity. Shares would be issued to the other American republics taking part, and branches or agencies would also be established beyond Washington. The bank would have no power of no issuance, but could issue letters of credit and make loans. The American International Bank was endorsed by President Benjamin Harrison, Ooh. Secretary of State James G. Blaine, Ooh. and a subcommittee of the Committee on Banking and Currency, as well as by industry journals. No headway was made with its organization. In 1897, during the fall convention of the New York Board of Trade and Transportation, the idea of an American international bank was again raised. Delegates cited its importance in facilitating hemispheric trade and furthermore in promoting the international financial supremacy of New York City. Why may not Greater New York become first the clearinghouse of business of this hemisphere, and later on the clearinghouse of the commerce of the world? That year, Congress passed a bill authorizing the charter for the American International Bank. Initially, it would be capitalized at $5 million, though this sum would be increased to a maximum of $25 million. The comptroller of the currency would supervise it. After some senators complained of its potential monopoly on international banking, the bill was amended, allowing any group of citizens complying with the requirements of the charter to organize a similar institution. The plan for the bank received strong editorial endorsements from the Washington Post and the New York Times. The latter linked the bank's importance to gender discourses of national development and imperial virility, claiming that the lack of an American international bank was an affront to the United States' manliness. This nation combines in a singular degree the powers of stalwart manhood with the weakness of infancy, the New York Times wrote. Contrasting the manufacturing strength of the country with its dependence on European exchanges, it saw the current U.S. approach to commerce as a preposterously childish way of doing business. The bank remained an idea only, a vision sketched on paper. The following year, commenting on the lack of movement in the bank's realization, the Bankers Magazine reversed its position from earlier in the decade and claimed that there was no need for a federal institution whose business could be handled by existing private, state, and national banking institutions. The editors evoked a populist suspicion of federally organized banking institutions with monopoly privileges that was a hold over the bank wars of the Jackson era. Naturally, they wrote, it is suspected that the extraordinary powers are desired to enable the incorporators to exercise a sinister competition in other branches of the banking business. They also argued that the nation's existing banking infrastructure could quite simply do the job. Delegates to the Second International American Conference, held in Mexico City in 1902, returned to the question of an American international bank and voted in support of the organization of a Pan-American bank similar in form to those of the previous conferences. But again, nothing happened. 
Plans for a federally chartered international financial institution stalled, dissipated, and eventually disappeared. However, a number of private bankers, rogue bankers, stepped into the arena, taking up the cloak of Pan-Americanism and the mantle of Pan-American banking. They found their way around legislation restricting branch banking and international banking by chartering in states which liberal banking laws like Delaware and West Virginia. They operated unsupervised across national borders and in the lax parentheses are non-existent regulatory environments in the Caribbean and Central America where weak governments had little power to curb their activities. Although publicists hyped these institutions when they were first chartered, their actual activities remain obscured to historians. The Pan American Bank and Trust Company, parentheses PABTC, for instance, was chartered in 1903 by a syndicate of Northeastern Banking and Industrial Interests. Journalists claimed the PABTC would eventually have control practically of the finances of Mexico after being granted a liberal concession by the Mexican government. There are no records of this bank's achievements or of its failure. Still other banks like the West Virginia Chartered, Illinois-based American International Bank were found to have depositors but no assets. When the American International Bank went into receivership in 1905, all the Chicago police could claim was its furniture. Its dissolution prompted calls for more stringent regulations of institutions using the word bank in their name. William H. Ew. Hunt's Pan American Bank was the most notorious example of this species of U.S. international financial institution, and Hunt Ew. himself perhaps typified the personality of these bankers. Born in Alabama, Hunt had Ew. organized financial institutions in Selma before moving to Northeast. He traveled to Mexico and studied its financial organization, coming to the conclusion that while it was silver based, had archaic banking laws based on the Code Napoleon and employed crude business methods, a U.S. bank could be successful there and could potentially break European monopoly on banking. Seeing the possibility of diverting remittance income from European banks in Mexico and undoubtedly encouraged by the political and economic climate created by Porfirio Ooh. Diaz and his finance minister Jose Yavez Limitor, both of whom maintained liberal economic policies that encouraged foreign investors, Hunt Ooh. looked into the possibilities of banking and finance in Mexico. In 1901, Hunt organized the Mexican Trust Company, parentheses MTC, in Mexico City. Seven branches of the MTC were established throughout Mexico. Agencies were established in New York City and Chicago, and Hunt Ew. further planned to expand the trust company throughout the United States, South America, and Europe. After only six months, the MTC was turning a profit and attracting interest from U.S. investors. Hunt decided to expand the company, merging it with the Corporation Trust Company of Delaware to create the International Banking and Corporation Trust Company, parentheses IBCTC. A circular release by the bank claimed that under Mexican corporation laws, the combined charter of the new company allowed it to engage in any and all lawful business whatsoever, wheresoever, and whensoever, including the power to undertake the management of a sovereign government. Well, might the prospectus of the IBCTC remark in closing, quipped the New York Times, under this charter, no opportunity for profit need be neglected. For there is practically no limit whatsoever to the scope of the operations allowed. It continued to operate the branches in Mexico and announced plans for branches in Nicaragua, Cuba, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. Less than a year after its merger, the IBCTC was in crisis. On October 18, 1903, the Mexico City branch of the IBCTC closed its doors and the Mexican courts appointed a receiver to preside over its liquidation. The bank's cashier claimed he had received a telegram from Hunt Ew. instructing him to forward all deposits to the New York parent, draining the bank of funds. Hunt Ew. denied the cashier's accusations and blamed the insolvency on a sudden bank run by panicking Mexican depositors who withdrew more than $600,000, wiping out the company's reserve. Following the IBCTC's collapse, Hunt set about reorganizing the bank by forming a new company, the Pan American Bank, parentheses PAB. 
IBCTC depositors were offered stock options in the new institution at the par value of their deposits, but during the reorganization it emerged that the new underwriters were barely solvent and that the stockholders of the bank directed deposits to personal accounts despite knowing of the bank's insolvency. The company's underwriters had marginal credit at best, and the directors appeared to be reorganizing for their own benefit. Hunt was arrested in New York on January 21st, 1905 and extradited to Chicago. The press reporting on his every move where proceedings were instigated against him for what was described as collusion, trickery, and fraud. Hunt initially pleaded not guilty to the charges, claiming securities he possessed would cover depositors' losses. Two weeks later, however, apparently realizing he was caught, he admitted his culpability and in September 1905 was found guilty of embezzlement, ordered to pay a fine of $298, and sentenced to a one to three year prison term in the Juliet prison. He was paroled largely because of the efforts of his wife. She maintained his innocence during his trial and imprisonment, eventually securing both a pardon and financial backing from her father to allow Hunt Ew. to re-enter business. She would divorce him soon afterward. Hunt Ew. was caught frequenting the brothels of New York while his repute with prostitutes in both Havana and Santo Domingo was described as notorious. The International Banking Corporation emerged from the failures and false starts of turn-of-the-century Pan-American banking, yet its origins were in Asia, not the Americas. And before it was established in Panama and Mexico, it was participating in the U.S. Imperial Projects in China and the Philippines. The IBC was organized by Colonel Thomas Ew. H. Hubbard, a union veteran and a corporate attorney, who had been a partner in the law firm Butler, Stillman, and Hubbard since 1888. The Stillman in question was the brother of the Citibank's James Stillman. Ooh. Hubbard Ooh. was well known for his corporate litigation and was involved in corporate reorganization and trust management. He was a director or trustee of financial institutions, insurance firms, and railroad companies, including the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Mexican International Railroad, and the Guatemala Central Railroad. Marcellus Hartley, Ooh. the Connecticut industrialist and arms dealer in charge of Remington Arms Company and the Union Metallic Cartridge Company, was the IBC's first president. After Hartley's Ooh. sudden death, he was replaced by Valentin Ew. P. Snyder, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Company, among the largest and most powerful insurance companies in the United States. The IBC was closely connected to Equitable. Directors of the Equitable Company originally sat on the board of directors of the IBC, but resigned when Snyder Ew. decided it would make operations difficult, especially as they had a controlling interest in the Western National Bank of the City of New York, an institution that they thought would compete with the IBC. The Equitable sold many of its shares to Hubbard, Ew. but remained one of the IBC's larger shareholders. Its rival, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, was also an initial subscriber to the IBC stock. Hubbard Ew. and the directors wanted to use the IBC to create a U.S.-controlled international branch bank network that could support the extension of U.S. commerce overseas while profiting from the business of U.S. colonial finance and the insular territories in China. But the IBC was faced with a practical problem of legality. It realized that to create an international institution, it had to find a way around a set of legal and regulatory roadblocks governing the organization of both domestic and international banking and create an entity that could navigate plural, transnational, legal environment of global finance. The National Bank Act's explicit injunctions against branch banking created a legal impediment but the IBC was faced with a practical problem of legality. It realized that to create an international institution, it had to find a way around a set of legal and regulatory roadblocks governing the organization of both domestic and international banking and create an entity that could navigate the plural transnational legal environment of global finance. The National Bank Act's explicit injunctions against branch banking created a legal impediment to the foreign expansion of federally chartered national banking associations, such as the National City Bank of New York. 
At the same time, within the banking community, there were questions concerning whether or not the authority of the act extended to the insular territories. From 1898, Charles Dawes, the comptroller of the currency, was receiving requests and queries regarding the possibilities of incorporating national banking associations in Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Dawes surmised that the authority of the act was limited to the continental United States, and he argued the U.S. Congress to enact legislation regulating banking in the insular territories and setting out the legal relations of domestic banks to the U.S. colonies. Like the delegates to the 1889 International American Conference, whose report he cited, he argued that without its own international, or what he called intercolonial, banking institutions, U.S. foreign trade would be impaired, as would the development of the colonies themselves. The extension was now forthcoming. Wall Street found the U.S. government reluctant to support the internationalization of banking and indifferent to its demands for the regulatory reform to enable foreign expansion. Instead, governmental requirements were privileged over commercial ones in the U.S. colonies. The state's immediate financial needs were for depositories and fiscal agents who could collect and disburse insular revenues and Treasury Department funds. Private banks and trust companies were authorized to do so, leading to the establishment of Samuel Jarvis North American Trust Company in Cuba and to both Henry Day Ford and Company and the American Colonial Bank in Puerto Rico. In light of these regulatory constraints, the IBC found a way to combine the banking functions of colonial governance with those of commercial finance. It was also able to manipulate both the domestic dual system of regulation and the discrepant and plural geographies of international jurisdiction and legal authority. Chartered in January 1901 as the International Company, the directors changed its name to the International Banking Corporation two months later. Connecticut was chosen as a state of incorporation because of its liberal banking laws. Provisions on the supervision and inspection of banking institutions were lax, and the state had no specific injunctions against branch banking, foreign or otherwise. The charter was written by John Randolph Ooh. Dos Passos, a specialist in corporation and banking law, who organized H.O. Hathmayer's American Sugar Refining Company, and who was both an advocate for the expansion of corporate capitalism and a defender of Anglo-Saxon racial purity. It was broad and capacious indeed, nearly limitless in its scope. It allowed the IBC to undertake and execute any and every kind of contract and to transact and engage in any other lawful business whatsoever, without regard for geographic restriction. The corporation hereby created is authorized and empowered to have one or more offices to carry on all or any of its operations and business in any state, territory, dependency, or possession of the United States, or in any foreign country, as for said, read the charter, and without restriction to the same extent as natural persons might or could do in any foreign place. Configuring the IBC as a natural person, the Charter imbued the institution with the authority and power to conduct business without any restriction in any foreign place. This created a conceit that gave the IBC the power to operate in the absence of legal authority, assuming that foreign places did not have their own internal systems of jurisdiction that constrained the activities of U.S. businesses. Furthermore, among the IBC's power was the ability to establish branches in any part or parts of the world. With the stroke of a lawyer's pen, the IBC was able to evade legal restrictions on foreign branch banking and immediately became a coveted organization within the Wall Street community. At the same time, they had long held a vision of an independent republic that could serve as an international crossroads of commerce and would be governed by laissez-faire principles of free trade. At the same time, as perceived by Americans, the Panamanians were still governed by the traditional backward Spanish modes of commerce, banking, and finance. As with Samuel Jarvis's Ew. perceptions of Cuban business person, the view of the Panamanian elite was defined by suspicion, skepticism, paternalism, and an innate sense of normative quality of U.S. business culture. 
To some degree, Isaac, Brandon, and Bros, one of the merchant bankers that Morgan Ew. encountered during his exploratory trip through the Isthmus, epitomized this contradiction between cosmopolitanism and perceived backwardness. Brandon Ew. and his brothers were descended from Portuguese Jews who had fled the Inquisition to Jamaica. Isaac Brandon had arrived on the Isthmus in 1868 from the United States and established an import-export firm that had monopolized trade in tobacco and in other products. They had helped to finance the revolution against Colombia, hoping in part to benefit from the economic sovereignty of the Isthmus. Brandon founded the Panama Banking Company in 1905. It was one of the firms that had contracted with the Canal Commission to act as its fiscal agent. The parent firm, Isaac Brandon & Bros, though based in Panama, was incorporated in New Jersey. The Panama Banking Company had offices in both New York and Panama, and its charter was from West Virginia. While benefiting from the modern incorporation laws of the United States, the Panama Banking Company drew much of its institutional identity from its family roots. Back of the Panama Banking Company stands an element of strength that few banks possess spread the tax in an advertisement, the unwritten but powerful guarantee of family pride and honor dating from 1868 when Isaac Ew. Brandon, its president, founded in the Republic of Panama present business. This reliance on the guarantee of family pride and honor often slid into the terrain of kinship, patronage, and outright graft. At the same time that Brendan told Morgan that there was no chance of success for the IBC in Panama, Morgan also alleged that Brandon told him that he would accept the management of it if the pay was sufficient. Morgan claimed that both Ehrman and Duquay offered the same arrangement. The president, Amador, offered a slightly different proposal. According to Morgan, Amador entered his room in the Hotel Central unannounced during the siesta to discuss a little business on the side. He wanted to rent his buildings to the IBC in case Morgan wanted to open a branch in Panama. Morgan also learned that two of the president's daughters were married to sons of Irma. The IBC faced other problems in its expansion. In the first instance, there was a problem of staffing. At the time of the IBC's organization, the United States had nothing resembling a cohort of indigenously trained international bankers. Staff for international branches and for international banking, when called from within the profession, often had no prior foreign experience, and when called from without, often had no prior banking experience. Many of the IBC staff were not people who found it easy to tell the Chinese apart as one banker put it, and often their contempt for Caribbean, Latin American, and Asian people was barely concealed. The IBC hired a number of employees from oh. Samuel Jarvis's banking institutions, including Clawson and Cole for the Mexico City branch, but more often than not, staff were recruited from British, German, and Canadian institutions. Oh. Jay Swellman Tate, for instance, James Ew. Morris Morgan's superior at the IBC's DC branch, learned the ropes of the banking industry as an employee of the British Linen Company Bank and the London and Southwest Bank. John R. Ew. Lee, an individual who had previously spent 22 years with the Chartered Bank, was brought in to run the New York office. The New York office also hired two Germans from Deutsche Bank, Wilhelm Pannenborg and Bernard Duis. As accountants, and the Manila branch was staffed by R.W. Brown, who had 15 years of experience with the Charter Bank. Ew. James Furon had been involved in Chinese commerce since 1870. He had no previous experience as a banker. Both Furon Ew. and Edward Quelch, the Shanghai branch's unqualified accountant, had to rely on telegraphic instructions from New York City. John R. Lee Ew. of the New York office was eventually sent to Shanghai to clean up the mess created by Fira Ew. and Quilch. This lack of experience in banking was also felt in the New York office, where John Ew. Hubbard and Charles Palmer Ew. were employed. Hubbard's Ew. main qualification was that he was the son of the IBC's president. Palmer, Ew. a West Point graduate and retired army officer, had even fewer qualifications than Ew. Hubbard. Although his only encounter with international banking came from the mere fact of having spent time in the Philippines, he rose through the IBC's ranks, becoming inspector of its Asian branches. 
branch manager at Manila and Cebu from 1905 to 1909 and manager of the entire bank from 1909 to 1915. Despite his evident success in establishing the IBC's branches in Panama, James Morris Morgan's resume as a banker was a short one. When he joined the IBC, he was nervous about keeping a desk job and slightly overwhelmed by his prospects as a banker. I am not accustomed of late years to keep office hours and 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. comes a little hard at first, but I will soon become accustomed to it, Morgan wrote in a letter. It makes me feel funny sometimes, he continued, to be sitting amidst great piles of other people's money while signing bills of exchange and checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars and then think that I have not 30 cents max to jingle in my pocket that belongs to me. Is it ludicrous or pathetic? Although not versed in the practical methods of banking, Morgan brought other skills and other experiences to the IBC. The eugenical news described Morgan yeah. as made of fighting adventurous stock, and certainly recollections of a rebel reefer presents him as brash and roguish, qualities that were heightened during his belligerent negotiations with the Panamanians. These qualities made yeah. Morgan an ideal figure to patrol the international frontiers of U.S. capitalism. Morgan yeah. also lived through the violent crucible of racial capitalism in the 19th century United States. Born on a cotton plantation in New Orleans in 1845, Morgan's Ew. earliest memories were of the almost apocalyptic tableaux of Southern life. In the opening pages of Recollections of a Rebel Reefer, Ew. Morgan recounts witnessing an angry crowd of white men and women cursing Seminole Lee prisoners who were being transported from Florida to the Indian Territory. One of Morgan's Ew. uncles was killed during the Seminole Wars, and he felt that if given a chance, the crowd would murder the Seminoles. Morgan Ew. also recalled the explosion of the steamboat princess on the Mississippi and the chaotic and gruesome scenes of burning cotton bales floating downriver as Day's members of the boat crew wandered the shore, engulfed in flames. Nearly 100 people died in the explosion. The shock Morgan Ew. fled to the comforting arms of Katish, his old black nurse. Morgan Ew. enrolled in the Naval Academy at Annapolis, but dropped out at 16. He was taken on by merchant slave owner and cotton planter George A. Turnholm, whose firm, Fazer Turnholm & Company, financed the Confederacy. Turnholm's son, William Ew. Lee, was a director of Samuel Jarvis's North American Trust Company. Morgan joined one of Fraser Turnholm's ships and ran cotton around the blockades during the Civil War until he joined the Confederate Navy. For Morgan, Ew. emancipation and the defeat of the Confederacy brought on a new horrific racial order whose values were debased and whose hierarchies were upended. Since emancipation, Morgan Ew. commented, an English bulldog was worth a great deal more to me than a free N-word. Morgan Ew. disdained black self-government, and he was disgusted by what he viewed as the decadent spectacle of Reconstruction. After the defeat of the Confederacy, Morgan Ew. joined a group of former Confederate soldiers serving in the army of the Egyptian Khedive. Upon his return to the United States, he took over one of Trenholm's Ew. plantations near Charleston. He described legislative sessions of South Carolina as a circus where both white carpetbaggers and black legislators enacted pretentious and absurd theater of politics. Morgan Ew. mocked the language and comportment of black lawmakers and politicians, bristling at their use of Sea Island and Ricefield Pigeon English, and he ridiculed what he saw as the ostentation, extravagance, and gaudiness of free blacks. His contempt for free blacks anticipated that for the Panamanians. The IBC was coveted by other institutions and other bankers despite its ambivalent success. The Citibank and Frank A. Vanderbilt in particular watched the development of the IBC and almost from the moment of its organization considered taking it over. Funderlip and the City Bank were embarking on a period of expansion and internationalization and had been largely frustrated in their attempts to organize foreign branches. He had long sought a way around the regulatory constraints hampering foreign branch expansion and had long coveted the bank network of the IBC. 
As early as 1909, Vanderlip no. looked to purchase the IBC through the consortium of U.S. banks and corporations, including Grace and Company and J.P. Morgan and Company. The city bank's foreign exchange manager, John E. Garden, interviewed managers of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation and the Chartered Bank of India, Australia, and China regarding the condition and reputation of the IBC. He learned that its headquarters in New York was an impediment to its business in Asia, and it was staffed by men without Asian experience. As a banking concern in New York, they certainly are a failure as most of their losses have been made right here, Garda noted. He continued, Not understanding the Eastern business, it is very difficult to imagine how such a function can be carried out in an intelligent manner. Yet Garden believed that experience could be gained from the losses and that the Citibank should reorient the IBC to its proper field, the Americas, especially the Atlantic coast of South America. There is no reason in my mind why the legitimate South American business should not be taken care of by the National City Bank indirectly through this cooperation, Garden concluded. And with good management and care, there is a good prospect of success in view of the approaching development of the relations between this country and the South American continent. Garden suggested the Citibank should sell the agencies of the IBC to German banking interests and hold on to the Manila branch because of its ties to the U.S. insular government. The difficulty was in the acquisition. Hubbard still owned a majority of the IBC shares. The equitable company controlled a smaller amount and the rest were scattered throughout various holdings. Although he encouraged Vanderbilt to pick up the stock on the open market as it became available, Hubbard did not want to sell. He was reluctant to relinquish his controlling interest in the institution he had created and worried that if Herman Siegelkin, a German-American merchant who held a monopoly on coffee exports, was put in charge of the bank, the IBC staff would suffer under what was perceived to be Sickling's efficient and strict regime. Vanderlip mused to Stillman that a good deal of ruthlessness would be exactly what the present staff would need in order to put it in a good working condition. By 1914, the International Banking Corporation had 16 overseas branches in addition to the state-chartered International Bank within its fold. It had the largest foreign branch network of any U.S. banking institution, but its problems of staff and management, of capitalization and organization had not propelled it into the ranks of the imperial banks in the way in which Thomas Hubbard had envisioned. The branch networks of Canadian institutions, such as the Royal Bank of Canada and the Bank of Nova Scotia, dwarfed the IBC in size especially in the Americas, where the IBC's presence was limited to Panama and Mexico. In 1912, the IBC's Washington, D.C. operations were sold to the United States Trust Company. The branches in Mexico City and Monterey were closed in 1914 because of the fear of political economic instability brought on by the Mexican Revolution. In the Philippines, the IBC lost its role as fiscal agents with the establishment of the state-controlled National Bank of the Philippines in 1916. British banking institutions such as the London and River Plate Bank and the Anglo-South American Bank also maintained a position of dominance in the Americas. In the Asia-Pacific region, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation had 30 branches. The challenge to the competitiveness of the IBC came not only from foreign international banks, but from within the United States. With the signing in late 1913 of the Federal Reserve Act, national banking associations were permitted to establish foreign branches with the approval of the Federal Reserve Board. The legal and regulatory regimes had constrained institutions like the Citibank and the First National Bank of Boston were dismantled and the competitive advantage that the IBC once had was removed. The Citibank was quickest off the mark. In the fall of 1914, it established its first foreign branch in Buenos Aires, a location where the IBC was not active. The First National Bank of Boston followed the Citibank into Argentina. In 1914, the Commercial National Bank of Washington, D.C., CNB, 
opened its first foreign branches in Colon and Panama, establishing itself as a direct competitor to the IBC. The directors of the CMB were spurred by the opening on August 15, 1914 of the Panama Canal. The onset of maritime travel through the isthmus drastically reduced the time and cost of shipping, collapsing the space of global commerce and bringing Atlantic ports closer to those on the Pacific and the markets of Asia closer to the merchants and industrialists of New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and New Orleans. The canal's opening encouraged the consolidation of the Caribbean as a military and strategic unit as the need to defend shipping lanes and man coaling stations along its routes demanded regional political stability via increased diplomacy, militarization, and the eviction of European, especially German, commercial and banking interests. It also created the need for a new set of financial and banking services for U.S. imperialism. No longer was the primary demand for a system and infrastructure for the payment of laborers. Instead, institutions were needed for the operation of the canal itself and its maritime traffic. The CMB's directors used its Washington connections to compete with the IBC for the federal deposits for the canal zone. The branches of both institutions served a number of purposes. They were involved in canal-related shipping and trading, including the handling of canal tolls and fees and the expenses for fuel, repair work, and other needs, charging owners of vessels one-eighth of one percent of the transaction's amount. They served as depositories for the U.S. Treasury, the Panama Railroad, the Panama Canal Commission, and the U.S. Army and Navy and acted as the official dispersing agent for the accounts of the latter. As a paymaster for U.S. military personnel stationed on the Atlantic side and as agent for the accounts of the Army and Navy's post exchanges and ships service stores. The CMB also was established as a local bank of deposit and discount offering savings accounts and personal banking services for both the expatriate community and Panamanians. The passage of the Federal Reserve Act also made the IBC vulnerable to the threat of takeover by the larger Wall Street institutions that it had come up against. When Hubbard oh. died in 1915, the Citibank pounced. It purchased a controlling interest in the IBC, using financier and IBC director Jules S. Bach as an intermediary. Much of the IBC's board was replaced by city bankers. James Morris Morgan resigned from his post in Washington and retired. A year later, the city bank's garden wrote a report titled, What Shall We Do With The International Banking Corporation? Garden likened the purchase of the corporation by the Citibank to the Louisiana Purchase. He argued that the IBC's profitability was not something that the Citibank would look to in the short term, but that over the long term, given the relatively slow pace at which the Citibank was opening overseas branches since the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, the purchase of the IBC could accelerate this process. In two years, he noted, the Citibank had opened branches in only six cities, Rio de Janeiro, Santos, Sao Paulo, Montevideo, and Buenos Aires. At this rate, it will take a generation to cover the world as it must be covered within a reasonable time to crush the aspirations of rivals, Garden wrote, and to make the Citibank the master of foreign trade situations so far as banking operations are concerned. Despite Garden's Ooh. lament for the Citibank, that mastery would soon come. It would arrive on the back of the pioneering foreign branch banking network created by the IBC. And the Citibank would inherit many of the IBC's difficulties with staffing, regulation, and racial capitalism.